What I'd like to do now is take the observations of the little experiment we've just seen on the torsion of a bar and turn it into a theory that allows us to describe what happens when you twist a bar. And what we're going to do is uh, consider slender bars uh, with a circular cross section. Later on we'll look at bars that have a non-circular cross section, but for right now we'll work with the circular cross section case. And the goal here is to develop a theory to describe the mechanical behavior of circular bars under torsional loads. And we want to be able to answer questions such as what are the stresses, what is the motion, how much load is required to give a certain amount of motion, etc. And basically we want to parallel what we had for the case for axial bars. For, so recall what we had when we had the theory of the deformation of bars under axial forces. We had a, a kinematic relationship that related the strains to the displacements. So that was the, the first relationship here. and. We had equilibrium relationships. We had relationships that connected the internal forces to the stresses in the system. And we also had a stress-strain relationship. And what I'd like to do for the case of the torsional bar is to develop parallel concepts. So a kinematic concept, concepts of equilibrium and relationships to resultants, as well as a stress-strain relationship. So we build a complete system of equations just like we had before and try and build on using our notion that we have of the full three-dimensional theory that we've just gone through also at the same time. And the key really to being able to do this is a well-chosen kinematic assumption. And that kinematic assumption is built off what we've just observed in the experiment where I've twisted the bar and watched the motion. So let's go ahead and have a look at that. So I've, I've drawn in the bar here that we had before, and I'll measure position using the z-coordinate from the bottom of the bar upwards, and the bar will have a radius of capital R. So that's my, that's my setup. So capital R, coordinate z here. And let's go ahead and consider a section of the bar of length delta z, and we're going to examine this and try and apply what we just saw in, in the experiment to this section. So let me read it. So I have a section of bar of length delta z. And what we observed in the experiment was that the cross section, so at any given value of z, the cross section rotated as a rigid body. Okay. So what I can do is I can describe that motion with a rotation field. So I'll use the symbol phi for my rotation field. And so at a fixed value of z, the material rotates rigidly. And so it has some given value rotation, which is described by the function phi of z. So at the bottom, it's phi of z. And at the top, it's phi of z plus delta z, because I'm at a different elevation there. So this is my setup here. That's what we've observed. Uh, now I'm going to take it one small step further. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a small core out of this section delta z of radius little r. So little r is just some arbitrary radius that I picked that's less than capital R, of course. And let me go ahead and redraw that now. So I have my core here of radius little r. And I'm going to go ahead and scribe onto this core here a uh, little rectangle here, with corners a, b, c, and d. So this is like the grid that we saw on that experiment. And now if I consider what happens when we rotate the bar or, or twisted it, what happened was that, that the grid skewed itself. And so the rectangle turned into a parallelogram. And we know exactly what that motion is going to be because we know what the rigid rotation is of each section. So that's our assumption. So the, the motion of the point C is going to be an amount R times phi. And the motion, say, of point A is going to be r times phi of z plus delta z. So that's our observation. And a and b move the same amount, and c and d move the same amount. And those are obviously different amounts, because there's more rotation, say, at the top than there is at the bottom. OK. So this is the setup that we have here. And now what we'd like to do is turn this into a kinematic relationship like we had for the axial deformation, where we're able to relate motion, in that case, displacement u, to the strains epsilon, normal strains. And now in this case here, we're going to try and relate the rotation field to some type of strains. OK, so let me redraw the picture here a little bit. So I have my points a, b, c, d. Uh, c is separated from a by an amount delta z. And I've also put my coordinate axes here. So I've unwrapped the surface of the cylinder. So that's why the horizontal axis here is, is labeled to be theta. So that's the angular coordinate here. And so the green 
uh, square is my original uh, set of points, and after deformation, I have this parallelogram uh, drawn in purple. Now, if I I can draw in also the motion, so C and D they each move an amount r phi, and A and B they move an amount r phi of z plus delta z. And if I look at this picture, I see that the basic strain that the system is undergoing is a, a shear strain, and the, the shear strain, if I label it properly, would be gamma z theta. So it's a change in angle in the z theta plane of my system here. Okay, so, well, if I have, from the diagram here, I can actually write down an expression for gamma z theta. So if, if, I, if I try and compute that angle there, I'll have r times the change in the rotation from the bottom to the top, divided by the distance delta z. And if I then take the limit as delta z goes to zero, I'm going to find that the shear strain is equal to r d phi dz. So we can put that all together, and I have my final result, is that the shear strain in the system is a function both of radial position and axial position, so r and z, and is related to the rotation of the cross sections through their derivatives multiplied by the radial, radial distance r. So it's a little bit of a more complicated expression than we had for axial forces, but Notwithstanding, we have a relation, a kinematic expression that relates motion, in this case rotation phi, and shear strain gamma. And this occupies in the theory the exact same place that our relationship that said epsilon is equal to du dx occupies. Um, let me point out that gamma z theta is not a constant on the cross section. If I plot gamma z theta uh, versus r, I'm going to get a straight line. So the center of the bar, the shear strain is going to be zero, and then at the outer radius, the shear strain is, is going to be maximal. So here it will be equal to r d phi dz. So this is looking at a fixed value of z along the bar. And at any value or elevation z, the, the twist rate can be different depending on how the bar has been loaded. Uh, and it's important to note that this observation of linear shear strains on the cross section is completely independent of material response. Uh, one can easily show it with an elastic bar, but the bar could be a composite bar, it could be actually deformed into nonlinear range plastically, and this observation of the linear behavior of the shear strains across the cross section uh, will remain true uh, to very good approximation. Uh, the other thing we can point out here is that the other way of stating our assumption on the motion is that the tangential motion u theta is equal to r times the rotation phi and that there is no radial or axial displacements. And if you use this assumption here and plug it into the general relations that connect the three-dimensional displacements to three-dimensional strains in the polar coordinate system, you'll find that all the normal strains are zero that the gamma zr and gamma r theta shear strains are zero, and the only non-zero shear strain or strain is gamma z theta. Uh, 